Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a podcast exclusively designed to create more reproductive health awareness and discuss your fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I'm so excited to have Dr. Blake Evans back on today's show. Hi, Blake. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. And thank you for doing so much research and talking to us about all the things that you're doing to answer really important questions for us. So if you guys don't know where Dr. Evans practices, he practices at University of Oklahoma Reproductive Medicine. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. So tell me about your practice. Tell me about what you do there. Tell us about yourself. Sure. So it is, as the name infers, it's an academic institution at University of Oklahoma. It's in Oklahoma City. In addition to myself, there are three other physicians, and we also have a physician assistant. We have a very busy practice and love being here. I'm sure they love having you too. And you did your fellowship at the NIH, and you did your residency at Oklahoma State University Medical Center in Tulsa, and your medical degree, your DO degree at the Oklahoma State University for Health Sciences in Tulsa as well. So I imagine it's nice to be home. Yeah. It is. Absolutely. Yes. Excellent. So as a fertility patient, one of the most frustrating things for our patients is to be in treatment and then have someone say, eh, stop, you can't move forward. You have to cancel your IUI. Don't you agree? Yes, absolutely. And so that's a huge disappointment, a huge disappointment. And I feel like we need to figure out like what is right for our patients. And you did a scientific study that was published in one of the most reputable journals, Obstetrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology. In May of 2020, and that study was titled Mature Follicle Count and Multiple Gestation Risk Based on Patient Age and Intrauterine Insemination Cycles with Ovarian Stimulation. Basically, it helps people figure out, like, when should their IUI be canceled based on the number of eggs they've ovulated? So I want you to break this down for us. Why did you do the study? Why? As a first-year fellow, particularly, I found myself commonly wandering the halls with pictures of follicles from the ultrasound and wondering at what point is it okay to proceed? Is this too many follicles based off of her age? Does this make it a factor in the outcomes? But the, the answer is we didn't, don't really know. Of course, all of my faculty have years of experience under their belt and just have an inclination as to when to proceed. But what is that number? What's the percentage that you can tell the patient, oh, based off of this number of follicles, based off of your age, based off of your prior cycles, this is going to probably be the risk of multiple gestation, meaning a twin or triplet or even higher than that. So that was the main drive as to why we wanted to do this study. And what was the clinical question you were hoping to answer? So really, I just wanted to know at what point are there too many follicles and does age make a factor? At what point is it appropriate to tell the patient, look, based off of the number of follicles we're seeing today, if you proceed, you have a pretty high risk of pregnancy. So we really wanted to see, does age make a correlation? Prior studies were not really specific in regards to the patient age number of follicles. There was a general number, but there was no specific guidelines or recommendation as to how many is, or how many follicles are too many to proceed. What is a mature follicle for people who are listening who don't know what that even means? Good question. So a mature follicle, well, at least based off of our study, the definition was 14 millimeters in size or greater. A mature follicle is potentially going to have a mature egg inside. And so if you have a mature follicle that releases an egg upon ovulation, then it can fertilize successfully and lead to a pregnancy. We know from doing in vitro fertilization and egg retrievals, you actually can get a mature egg in a smaller follicle, although it's less likely than 14 millimeters. But in general, that's around the size of when we would consider a mature follicle. Although during treatments, we're trying to get it a little bit larger so that we're more certain that there is a mature egg inside of the follicle. And that's something that you measure on an ultrasound, the pelvic Correct. ultrasounds and people go in. Correct. Yes. And what is a multiple gestation? So multiple gestation, we define in this study as the presence of a gestational sac with a fetal pole and cardiac activity. Having two or more of those present within the uterus was defined as a multiple gestation. So in our study, we had most commonly twins, but we certainly had a fair number of triplets and even quadruplets and some of the numbers that we looked at as well. You should have seen my eyes when you just said that. I have patients that come in and they're like, oh my God, I would love to have twins. And I'm just like, that's not the goal of treatment. So why is this 
multiple gestation considered a risk? Yeah, that's a really good question. And a very common misconception I feel like in our field is, oh, I need to have more follicles or more embryos transferred because it'll increase my chance of pregnancy. When in fact, and I'll show you the results in just a moment, that's not necessarily the case, a spoiler alert. However, multiple gestations, although twins are very cute, we all know someone or might even also have twins ourselves. However, they do come with quite a considerable risk. There's a fourfold risk of stillbirth in twins, even as high as sixfold risk of stillbirth in triplets. And then even higher for, as you can imagine, with quadruplets. They also come with the risk of preterm delivery, low birth weight, and also with those come other morbidities such as respiratory issues, intestinal issues, metabolic issues. And completely aside from how expensive it is to have a baby in the NICU for weeks on end. And in addition to that, the mother is also at quite a risk too, because there's a higher risk of preeclampsia, diabetes cesarean section, postpartum hemorrhage. So these are all things that we try to avoid if at all possible. And it's something that we really, really need to counsel our patients on when they're discussing these issues with us. I agree. And why does age matter? So age is a very important factor in infertility, mainly because when a woman, the number of eggs that a woman has, they've been there her entire life, even when she was developing in her mother's womb. So you can imagine that over time, the, both the quality and the quantity of the eggs will decline. And so the presumption is, and what we know now based off of the vast amount of literature, is that in patients who are older reproductive age, they typically will need more follicles or more embryos uh, in order to have a higher success of even just carrying a singleton pregnancy. So the factor of age is quite important whenever we're considering reproductive outcomes because it certainly plays a role. And what is IUI? So you, that was part of your study as far as looking at only IUI cycles. And why does it matter that you only included people who did IUI? That's a good question. So IUI, also known as intrauterine insemination, is a process that a fertility physician or provider will place a washed or prepared semen sample into the uterus around the time of ovulation. And the whole purpose of doing the washing of the semen preparation is that you get a more concentrated sample of higher motility sperm and to ideally increase your chances that the sperm will fertilize at least one egg or two eggs. The main reason we included IUI patients in, patients in the study is because most of the time, for example, if you are a couple that does time intercourse at home, it's less likely or much less commonly that you're going to come in for an ultrasound, although they still do. But at least when we're looking back at our EMR or electronic medical record, we have a much more robust number of patients of IUIs to look at. So um, adding timed intercourse in there as well would just muddy the waters a bit. So we kept it just an IUI. That makes perfect sense. And I think sometimes patients think that they have a higher risk of multiples if they add the IUI. Let's say they have no follicles. Do you think that's the case? I don't think so. I think that just the number of follicles there, you have to assume that the risk is, sp is still going to be present, even if you're just doing timed intercourse. So in those patients that do timed intercourse and they're monitoring with an ultrasound, I would still counsel them the same. Got it. And then what is ovarian stimulation? So ovarian stimulation is a process by which you take either an oral medication, such as clomiphene citrate, also known as Clomid, or letrozole, also known as Femara or even injectable medications, so gonadotropins like FSH or Folistim, Gonalef or Minipure. There's several different names. And these will induce follicular growth in the ovary. So all of the follicles that are inside the ovary are potentially going to grow and have a mature egg inside of them eventually. So the goal is to get just maybe a couple of follicles. However, with certain medications or different doses, the patient can respond quite differently and have too many follicles. Right. So the title, we've just basically defined all the terms, mature follicle count and multiple gestation risk based on patient age and IUI cycles with ovarian stimulation. So now, what did you guys find? So what we found, we looked at all IUI cycles at, it was at a single practice facility. It was at particularly a Shady Grove, is where this data came from, from 2004 to 2017. And we looked at all cycles that patients use either clomiphene citrate or they use letrozole or they use gonadotropins or even a combination of oral and injectable medications. 
and we looked at the patient's age and we basically categorized them and broke them down to less than 38, 38 to 40, and then over 40 years of age. And we looked at the outcomes. We looked at the pregnancy rates after doing the IUI. 38 to 40 years of age, the risk is not as dramatic, but it's still there. But the singleton rate, it does start to increase as the follicles change. However, the risk of multiple still increases uh, a, a decent amount. And then when you get into patients over 40 years of age, we actually found that it was beneficial to have more follicles here. So when you go from one all the way up to four follicles, it nearly triples the pregnancy rate, but you still have just a less than 1% chance of a multiple gestation. And even when you get to five follicles, this is when it did find that it was significantly at risk to have five follicles, but it's still overall a 3% risk of multiple spry UI. So it's, if you get pregnant, you have a 21% chance of it being a multiple, 5% of triplet, and then less than 1% chance of quads. The risk is similar for patients in this age. So this is less than 38 years of age, 38 to 40. We didn't have any quadruplets above three follicles, but this was a small number overall. And then once you get to patients that are over 40 years of age, you still see, in general, less than 12% chance of multiples up to four follicles. And above that is when we found that it was at risk for patients over 40. So we'll choose a 34-year-old, 15% chance with one follicle, and it goes up with two and three, four and five follicles. But we know that it's really mainly because of a risk of multiple gestations. So we can find someone, say, if she's 33 and she's got four follicles, you tell her, well, you just got a 5% chance of a multiple, but really when you, this is what really hits home here, it's the same patient. So say she has five follicles, her chance if she gets pregnant is as high as about 27% if she gets pregnant. And this is where I feel like it really hits home with the patient because they're like, you're right. I don't want to do a trigger shot. I am okay with canceling at this point. And so I feel like this is a really helpful counseling tool that we've been able to utilize. Yeah, I agree. I find that patients sometimes they want to take the risk, but unless they know like the exact number for themselves, they're not really made to be a part of the clinical decision-making process. And I think your study helps providers and patients just feel more informed for sure. And right. the other aspect of what you shared with us is the age over 40, because I have patients that, that patients are super educated. You know, they've done their research and they understand the risks associated with multiple gestations. And so when I tell a 40-year-old, you know, I'm perfectly fine doing IUI and not doing IVF for whatever reason, but I want to stimulate four or five eggs for you, they look at me like, but I don't want twins. Just shows that it's really to give them the highest chance to have a single baby with right. a very, very low chance of multiples. Exactly. Yeah. So patients who are doing IUI without being stimulated you know, over 40, perhaps they should rethink that if they have an AMH or ovarian reserve that can, you know, maybe give them more than one egg. Right. What advice do you have as a leading expert in our field for anyone pursuing ovarian stimulation with IUI? What kind of questions should they be asking their doctors? What should they be thinking about? I think that I would say that IUI is a very useful tool. It's a very, very helpful tool for infertility treatments. It's very common, but one thing that I would really strongly encourage patients to consider is that it unfortunately does not work every time. It's not a perfect treatment. It doesn't work every time. Even a couple with nothing at all infertility related, they only get pregnant about 20% of the time per month. So an IUI, even though it's not quite as high as that, it doesn't work every time, unfortunately. So the answer or what the thought process is of the patient, I would encourage you to not think, let's just increase the dose, let's make a higher dose and have more follicles because that's gonna help my pregnancy rates when in fact, it really is just gonna increase your multiple rate for the most part. Of course, that's age dependent, follicle dependent. We did also look at number of prior cycles before and how long they've been infertile for and that overall did not make a difference by and large. So we also broke down and explained infertility in PCOS patients and that risk was still present there in very similar numbers. And so one thing that in terms of providers that I would also say as well is that these numbers are not perfect. They, it's just a counseling tool. It's an estimation. It's something that you can, you can show the patient a figure. You can show them this is approximately what your risk of multiples, multiples will be. And in fact, that's been one of the 
probably the main criticism of this paper that I found, which I, I don't disagree with, is that using gonadotropins, some studies such as the Amigos trial, part of the RMN or Reproductive Medicine Network, that was in New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. It showed that just using gonadotropins had higher risk of multiples as opposed to clomid or letrozole. That is a big criticism of our paper. However, at the end of the day, I would like to believe, of course, and we can also look at this further in future studies, but I'd like to think that a follicle is a follicle, two follicles or three follicles are three follicles, and the risk in general is probably still going to be there, whether it's clomid or letrozole or gonadotropin. So although it's not perfect, I feel like this is a very helpful tool, and I, it certainly it has been great for me to show patients when counseling them as well. And then how many ovulation induction cycles with IUI should a patient basically say, enough's enough, it's time to move on to something else? Typically after about four, from four to six is typically what I'll counsel a patient. And then at that point, if it's not working, then we need to consider a different type of treatment after that. Awesome. Thank you for sharing your wonderful study findings with us. Thank you for all the research that you do. I quote and I send patients links to your articles several oh. times a week. So thank you for, for all the stuff you're doing. And thanks for coming on and just breaking it down for us. And Absolutely. you're going to come back and talk about your next study with us too. All right. That sounds great. I'm happy to do it. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Blake. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening and making The Egg Whisperer Show a part of your weekly routine. To find show notes and a full transcript for this episode, visit dramy.org and look under the blog tab. While you're there, you can find a link for the Egg Whisperer newsletter, which keeps you in the know about fertility news. You can also find Dr. Amy and the Egg Whisperer show on YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook. If you'd like to learn even more, Dr. Amy offers classes at the Egg Whisperer School, eggwhispererschool.com, or you can request a consultation on dramy.org. Thank you so much for tuning in and for sharing the Egg Whisperer show with others. Keep sparkling and have a great day.